Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. My name is uh, Veronika Řídelová. I am from uh, Vodafone Foundation, Czech Republic. And uh, I welcome you here to the guest lecture at uh, Charles uh, University, uh, where we will talk about a mobile app helping victims of domestic violence around the world. I am very uh, happy to welcome here in Prague uh, Phoebe Crowder, who is the manager of of global expansion of this uh, mobile app and uh, she has been here in Prague uh, for the 25th of uh, November which is the main day uh, for uh, elimination of violence of gender-based uh, violence uh, we use this opportunity to um, present you uh, to give uh, Phoebe the opportunity to uh, present about uh, bright sky app it's challenges its uh, successes uh, to the world over. And uh, I know that uh, many people are watching us uh, online across the whole world, so welcome everyone. And uh, I know that you cannot be here with us today, but you, cannot partic you can participate through Slido. So I would like to encourage you to join us at slido.com with hashtag bright sky and uh, there you can participate with your questions uh, which will be answered at the end of the lecture. The lecture will take about one hour and after that I will present you uh, with what we do here in Czech Republic regarding the Bright Sky Czech app, what we do, how, um, how we promote the app and uh, with what uh, successes. So now the time is uh, to welcome here, Phoebe Crowder. Phoebe, come here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. And uh, I'm sure that uh, the next uh, 60 minutes or so will be very uh, valuable for not only for students uh, of uh, Charles University, but to, uh, for any students uh, who is watching us uh, online. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. You can use this microphone. So thank you for being here. Um, as Veronica said, I'm here to talk about Bright Sky, which is a mobile app and website that is helping survivors of domestic abuse. My name is Phoebe Crowder. I work for Thames Valley Partnership, which is a UK-based NGO, which is funded by Vodafone Group Foundation to deliver Bright Sky globally. So just to sort of lay out what we'll be talking about today, first of all, I'm going to take you through and explain what is Bright Sky, explain to you a little bit about features and the evolution of the app. Then we're going to talk about the fact that this is a global expansion, so talking about a global tool in a local landscape. Then we're going to take a step back and look at violence and technology before going into looking at how we continue to grow a global product and reach survivors before I finalise with the future and have it a little bit the wrong way around there. Then we'll do the Q&A and then, as Veronica said, we'll talk about the Czech context. So I'd like to start by telling you about how I came to Bright Sky. So I spent my career in front lines supporting vulnerable young people through drugs and alcohol and dual diagnosis and child exploitation. I then went into frontline management working in gender-based violence and domestic abuse, as well as specialising in trauma-informed working, mental health and working alongside women in the criminal justice system. So why do I tell you this? Because I worked frontline. I worked directly with vulnerable people sort of sitting across from them and managing services that supported them. So it might not surprise you when I said to my friends that I was going to work in technology and domestic abuse and they said to me, but aren't you going to miss helping people? And what I couldn't quite articulate or even understand at the time was just how many people Bright Sky was going to be helping. So I'm hoping by the end of this lecture, you will also understand just what Bright Sky is managing to do across the world. So what is Bright Sky? And first, I think I'd like to just take a second to talk about Vodafone Foundation and their commitment to tech against abuse. So they've been committed for over 10 years to working in this sector with their Apps Against Abuse profile. It began in Spain with the Texas project alongside the Red Cross, which eventually got brought across to the UK. And that's actually the team that I sit as a part of now. But Vodafone really understood the role technology plays in supporting survivors of abuse. So we knew that whilst 
high-risk survivors most definitely need support to truly support survivors what we have to do is educate we have to work towards prevention and early identification and that is what bright sky does so bright sky is an app and website as you may have gathered for anyone concerned about domestic abuse its key features are a risk assessment that can be for self or others education and practical information and also a countrywide service directory. So the risk assessment is personally one of my favorite features. And what it does is it allows a user, whether a survivor themselves or someone supporting one, to work through a list of questions and begin to understand their situation and what's happening for them. So the questions are actually based on the CARDA dash risk assessment, which in the UK is a assessment that professionals use to basically understand whether or not someone is experiencing domestic abuse and what risk level they are. So those have been taken and made to be friendly and digestible for someone who is just sitting with their phone by themselves or with someone else to work through. And as they answer those questions saying yes or no or not sure, they end up with an answer saying you may be experiencing domestic abuse or whatever their situation is showing us through their answers to the questions. The education is a mix of different areas which kind of allow you to really begin to understand domestic abuse in the wider sense. So we have our case studies on sexual consent and stalking and these are real life scenarios put to a character that allows the user to go through the information and understand that actually they're not alone, other people might be experiencing this stuff too. And alongside that, we provide them advice and guidance around what that case study would do, which in turn allows them to understand what options are available for them. Our forms of abuse section provides simple explanations as to different forms of abuse. It's very broad and it allows a user to sort of understand this information in a safe and private way. And it doesn't force labels, but it also allows us to validate and contextualize the experiences that someone may be having. The Dispelling Myths section is another questionnaire and it allows a user to work through and really begin to debunk the myths that sit around domestic abuse. So we know that there is a lot of victim blaming and stereotypes that happen with abuse. So what it does is it works through and allows us to, in a gentle and informed way, begin to question if someone has those belief systems, but also support a survivor to understand that actually these things aren't their fault. The practical information are sections of sort of information that allows a user to really begin to take action. So the how I can help section is for those who might be supporting a survivor. So any one of us, myself included, could sit down, read that section and right away know how to support a survivor in what they're going through, be able to speak to them and support them onto specialist help. The types of support section lays out the types of support that are there to support a survivor. So as we know, a lot of times survivors will often think that the only option is to report to police, but actually there are a wide variety of different services out there to help them. So types of support through our videos steps them through those, giving them the autonomy to make the decision of what support they need. The leaving an abusive a relationship section is similar. It essentially lays out all the information a user may need to know if they want to leave an abusive relationship. It's very practical information for them to be able to risk assess their own situation, but also really we're again diverting them through to specialist help, which is the safest way for them to handle such a dangerous stage in their journey. The online safety guide again allows a user to understand risk and begin to implement different actions to keep themselves safe. So the nationwide service directory is in most of the countries we're live in, the only one of its kind. So to find support, often you would have to go to Google, type it in, and chances are you'll get tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of results, which is extremely overwhelming. Where do you start? But with Bright Sky, you can go in and by your current location or chosen location, search for support and then filter it down to begin to find what kind of support it is that you need. And lastly, the journal feature 
provides the user the ability to send messages, videos, voice notes that are date and time stamped. This can be used for a vi variety of reasons, such as gathering evidence, but also just really beginning to understand their own situation. So I actually spent um, some time on Thursday and heard a story from Rosa, who is the Czech Republic um, NGO at Bright Sky, and they spoke of how a user had uh, used the journal to send themselves information to begin to understand the gaslighting that they had experienced. And that's actually the first time I've heard of someone using the journal that way. But it shows that there are so many ways in which this can help validate a user's experience without expecting them to keep paper trails that the perpetrator could find. So Bright Sky has evolved and grown over the years. So you can see here it's had many iterations to where we are at today on the far right. And I guess, how do we decide to make these changes? Do I just decide one day that I think it needs an update? Well, no. So we go through a variety of different ways to gather this information. We do global surveys, we gather user feedback, we gather feedback from partners and specialists, we do research, and we also gather global learnings. So every time we go live in a new country, we're gathering risks, we're gathering successes, gathering the things that didn't quite go so well, and all of that feeds into how we continue to evolve and update the app. So an example here is our move from the 2.0 to the 3.0 system. So as you can see, it's quite different. The first one had two different pathways, where one for a survivor and one for those who may want to help them. And I have to say that when we made this change, I did have several professionals come up to me and say, why did you do this? We really liked the old pathways. And ultimately, it was because we were told that is what users needed to feel safe. It is far easier if a perpetrator were to download this app and see the two pathways to think, hmm, has the person downloaded this for themselves? Whereas our neutral interface, it really could just be a support app for anyone. You could say, I downloaded it for a friend, for a family member, for a colleague. It also helped us to increase the ease of use. So between the old system and the new system, there were three clicks that we managed to remove between a user reaching specialist help. Now you're probably thinking, three clicks doesn't sound like a lot. But for a survivor who perhaps has limited time to look on the app, or perhaps um, is nervous and experiencing trauma, we need to limit the amount of time it takes for them to download the app to be able to reach specialist help. So three clicks is actually a lot. The other addition is the fact that we added a website. So this was a huge step forward in the Bright Sky offering, and it provides access for all survivors, families, and professionals. Most importantly, it increases accessibility. So we have um, we are meeting the needs of people perhaps with learning difficulties where an app isn't as easy for them to use. We're meeting different age groups because not everyone is actually comfortable using a smartphone and apps. We are reaching those who don't have smartphones because most especially as we reach out into more countries, smartphone penetration simply isn't as good as it is in the UK. And then we're reaching those who simply cannot download an app. We've always known that Bright Sky isn't going to be safe for everyone, but why does that mean we shouldn't reach those people? A website means you can go to the local library, perhaps you can use your work computer or your one here at college and go on, visit Bright Sky, and no one will be any other wiser. And our users have told us just that. So we have survivor here from Italy who very much felt like the website was better for them. Go on, you can browse on a private browser. They found the information they needed and they left the website without any kind of trace. Whereas we had a survivor in South Africa who felt the app was better. They liked the fact that the 999 or the 158 button here in the Czech Republic is available to them as they're searching. Then also they found actually they thought there was less content so it was easier to understand. What's interesting is the app and website have the same amount of information, but it shows you that actually the way in which people navigate apps versus websites is very different. So this user felt like there was less information because of the way in which the app is structured, which is so important in terms of the nuance of meeting different learning needs. So as I've said, Bright Sky is actually a global tool. So we're live in 11 countries, over three continents, and by 2023, it will be 15 countries over five continents. 
And people will often say to me, this app is amazing, so why don't you just make it available worldwide? And honestly, why don't we? I could just go onto the app stores tomorrow and click a button and make sure it was available in every country over the world. And honestly, all survivors and people supporting survivors could benefit from it. And some stats would support this. So we see that domestic abuse numbers are fairly consistent the world over. So one in three women will experience domestic violence globally. And we know the impact of trauma doesn't discriminate psychologically, emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually. What's more, research tells us that the cost to businesses and economy is actually fairly consistent across different countries. And likewise, psychological abuse in studies has been found to be the most common form of abuse across any of the, the countries that they're studying. But whilst many facets such as impact and prevalence are consistent, there are some nuances that we need to think about because domestic abuse is similar, but it isn't the same the world over. So levels of domestic violence can actually vary despite the sort of consistent stats that I've just stated. So we know in less economically developed countries and those that have a wide gender disparity in terms of health, empowerment and labor, labor, labor participation have higher rates of DV. And also, in societies that are collectivist and marked by a high power distance, their rates of domestic violence are also higher. We also know that levels of acceptance differ. So what that means in certain countries, people will accept domestic violence as the norm more easily. So here you can see in South Asia, 47% of people actually justify domestic violence, whereas sub-Saharan Africa, it was 38%. We see that in democratic regimes, men are less likely to accept domestic violence. And places where women have more economic rights, people in general will be less accepting. Interestingly, places with political conflict in the last five years will also be far more likely to justify domestic abuse. We also know that understanding is varied. So in research recently done by the Vodafone Foundation, they found that physical and emotional abuse were the most recalled across the UK, Italy, and South Africa, but actually the understanding of different forms of violence was really varied. So what does all of this mean? So if we think about the socio-ecological model, which here illustrates all of those things that I've just spoken about, plus more, we have to understand how all of these elements intersect and feed into the prevalence, existence, and people's experience of abuse, which means we need to work intersectionally with an understanding of how all of these elements play and overlap in any given country. So in simple speak, Bright Sky needs to be localized to be effective. So for us to instigate change, develop societal conversation, and therefore support survivors, we need to meet people and collectives where they're currently at. And ultimately, if we bring it back just to the survivor, so that person sitting at the end of the phone, whether they're met by an individual or they're mobile, they need to feel seen and understood. And we can only do this if the product is localized to their local experience. So how do we do this? Well, we work with the local Vodafone Foundation in each of the countries, and we gather teams of specialist domestic violence organizations, police, government, and ministries, and they bring their local knowledge and help us to localize everything that sits within the app, from the content, to the videos, to the images. So we look at things like the legal system and how that differs, tone of voice and language, because how I speak to you about domestic violence may be different to how you speak about it in your country. We look at cultural context. We look at types of support because what we have available in the UK very much isn't what is available necessarily country by country. And now as we've gone live, we're creating new local content. So we're seeing from our users directly what information is missing that your local context needs. For example, here in the Czech Republic, they are building and soon going to be launching a new uh, section on the legal system. And whilst this ensures the integrity of our app, it's not without its challenges. So we started in the pandemic, and actually what was meant to happen was I was meant to be jet-setting and travelling all over the world to these foundations to help create these apps. But instead, I spent two years sort of on my laptop at home, so we had to change the working model. 
And it was difficult, but all the more needed because the pandemic really brought about the spotlight on domestic abuse. And in that, specialists are really stretched. They were busy prior to the pandemic, but during and after, they are even busier than they were. And as I've said, the content simply doesn't make sense unless you localise it. So we were asking of them a lot of work during an extremely busy time. Not only that, but we're working cross-culturally. So the way in which I work and sort of the specialisms that I bring don't necessarily make sense in the other countries. So it's very much about our specialists in that local country leading the way and us supporting them to create this product. What we've also found is there's a lack of resources. So how do we educate survivors? How do we educate people, but then also not provide them the through road through to specialist help? It's been extremely difficult in countries where there isn't as much support, especially in rural areas. And then we're a technological product and technology is always evolving. So what happens today is not what is happening tomorrow. So we have to keep up with that constantly. And then once we're live, it's difficult. Domestic abuse is still something that is hidden at home and people don't like to speak about. So whilst we have the product, how do we bring people to it? So I want to take a step out for a second and talk about violence and technology in general. We're going to show a video which is just two minutes. We've already seen drones flying over safe houses. Apps on smartphones that do things like GPS tracking. We've seen people fit kill switches to cars. It could be spy on a phone, it could be a hidden camera in a home. We've seen people program smart TVs to leave menacing messages every time the TV is turned on. It's insidious, terrifying, and experts say the use of technology to abuse women and children is getting worse. The women may not be carrying visible scars, but it's deeply, deeply distressing for them. It gives them a feeling of suffocation, like they can't escape. Women feel tethered by the technology, so it really, it's very hard to get away from, and it's 24-7. I had an app on my phone so he could follow me everywhere I went, so I knew every movement I did. I wasn't allowed to leave the home until a certain time, and I made sure I had to be back at a certain time. The tech abuse inflicted by Rose's ex compounded the physical and sexual violence. And after serving jail time, he tracked her down using Instagram. My daughter, who first received the first message, came out of her bed screaming. I live with fight or flight every single day. While tracking and monitoring devices have become smaller and cheaper, most technology abuse is low tech, like abusive texts or accessing emails and social media accounts. These people know your details, they know your passwords. Often they have gone to police um, and police haven't taken that um, seriously. This, like all family violence, is overwhelmingly gendered. 96% of perpetrators are male, 93% of victim survivors are female and increasingly kids are being caught up. More than a quarter of family violence cases were found to involve technology-based abuse of kids, including monitoring and blocking communication, harming their mental health in almost 70% of cases. And of course, these are just the cases that are reported. So as the video said, Perpetrators can use technology to monitor, harass, threaten, even impersonate, intimidate and stalk victims. And the thing is, not all technological abuse is domestic abuse, but most domestic abuse victims do experience some form of technological abuse. So UK Charity Refuge reported that 72% of women that they worked with identified being subjected to some form of technological abuse whereas the Safety Net project found that number was 97%. The pandemic made this even worse, with reports of almost 800% increase in the detection of monitoring apps and an almost 2,000% increase in the detection of spyware. So why am I sitting here and talking about how much harm technology can cause and how much risk it poses, but then also telling you technology is the answer? Well, firstly, access. We need to meet people where they're at, and ultimately where people are, their mobiles aren't far behind. So statistics show us that actually over 3 billion people own smartphones, and globally, the average person will spend 3 hours and 15 minutes on their phone a day, whereas US stats show us that 1 in 5 adults 
only access the internet via their phones. So to better explain why technology is the solution, I want to take a second and just look at some of the key facts on how survivors are being let down before reaching help. So 85% of victims will seek help on average five times from professionals in the year before they get effective help. On average, victims will experience 50 incidents of abuse before getting effective help. And on average, high-risk victims will live with DA for 2.3 years and medium risk victims for three years before getting any kind of effective help. And there are so many barriers that uh, stand between a survivor and getting effective help. And I think Veronica's going to put up on the Slido to see whether anyone can name any barriers. And I don't know if anyone here has a, any of them, but if not, I can just continue on. So I'll keep going and we'll see what people are going to say. So survivors meet so many barriers before being able to access a help so many of them also invisible we're talking physical emotional educational cultural as you can see here there are so many and these are just a few that we've picked out i think rupi Kaur said it right when she, in the poem she said don't ask me why i didn't leave he made my world so small i couldn't see the exit so I want to take a second and think about just a, one survivor and imagine that they face four main barriers. And I've picked four here that are really common for people that are experiencing abuse. So perhaps the survivor doesn't actually understand what's going on. They don't know that they're experiencing abuse because of a lack of awareness or education provided to them, or perhaps they've been gaslit into believing what they are experiencing is just normal. They are isolated or they have a lack of access to friends, family, to support. Perhaps they feel shame because we know often perpetrators will blame the survivor and tell them it's their fault. You made me do this. And perhaps the survivor has a fear of, or actually have experienced judgment. So we know often that people will victim blame and tell the survivor it's something that they did that caused this to happen. And lastly, maybe they've asked for help before and it just hasn't meant that they've reached support, such as the 85% I just mentioned. So what is Bright Sky doing to break down these barriers? Well, if the person doesn't understand what's going on, they go to the risk assessment. They work their way through the questions and begin to better understand what's going on for them or someone else and begin to spot the signs to understand if what they're experiencing is actually domestic abuse. Or perhaps they go to the education sections, work their way through and understand domestic abuse on a wider level. Or they could reach out to helplines and actually speak to someone about what is going on for them. If they're experiencing shame or a fear of judgment. Well, Bright Sky allows you to work on your own time by yourself until you are ready to reach out to someone else. Through the education or dispelling myths, that user begins to understand. They begin to understand that actually what is going on for them isn't their fault and has never been their fault and it provides them a direct route through to specialists. If they are isolated or lack access, well, Bright Sky gives you access from anywhere at the touch of your fingertips. Importantly, it helps that person to understand what help is out there and have the agency and control to pick what it is that they want to do about their situation. We know domestic abuse takes away the power and control from a survivor, so we are handing it back to them through them being able to make decisions. And lastly, perhaps they have asked for help before. So what does Bright Sky do? Well, it gives effective help every single time because it links you through to specialists. Not only that, but it equips others to better understand the situation so they are able to help effectively. And lastly, the practical guidance, again, gives the user the autonomy to understand what kind of steps they might need to take so they can begin to choose what they want to do and have the information they need without necessarily having to go to someone in their life. They can go direct through to those specialists. So what does breaking down these barriers mean? Essentially, technology provides solutions and it creates positive impact. And it does this by ensuring that the first time asking for help is the only time. Through, as I've said, a direct route to specialists for survivors or helpers, it educates 
on effective helping and it drives awareness. So it drives users through to specialist support by raising awareness. And as we go back to that five people that that person has to go through before getting help, well, instead of that, they either go direct through Bright Sky to specialist help or someone supports them through Bright Sky. And we're not sitting here asking people to be specialists. We don't expect you to have all of the knowledge if you are supporting someone, but Bright Sky does allow you to sit down and say, I don't necessarily know all the answers, but I have an application here that is gonna help us to help you find the support that you need. And what does reducing the time frame to help really mean? Well, it means a reduction in possible escalations to the violence being experienced, therefore the number of abusive incidents and possible risk to life. In a wider context, that means it's reducing a strain on the economy and businesses and the impact on health services in the short term and in the long term. Bright Sky also increases community education. So in that we're removing stigma we're reducing victim blaming and we're decreasing the acceptance of domestic abuse in society. But what we are doing is increasing people spotting the signs. They are developing confidence in helping and we are supporting conversations around healthy relationships. So in that creating community consciousness, which means people will be less tolerant of domestic abuse and more survivors are receiving support. We are also helping people to understand their situation by providing informed choice from step one. Often help seeking is hindered by the fact that people are fearful of what should I do or people telling them what they should do. And often that comes along with you must report, which we know is a fantastic option for some, but not for all. So through providing factual information about their situation, about helping them to understand what help is out there, and giving them autonomy, we are helping survivors in a trauma-informed way, which is the cornerstone of domestic violence support. So Bright Sky is transforming how people seek help, but also how people reach help. And that is why there is a role for technology in domestic abuse. So we are reaching survivors who may have never accessed help. We are increasing effective help seeking through access and education and in that, we're changing the landscape of domestic abuse. But most importantly, we're probably saving lives because we're helping those who may have never reached help and we're reaching them earlier. So as I've said, Bright Sky is a global product. And so far, there have been 316,000 downloads across the app and website globally, 70,000 of those here in the Czech Republic. There have been over 650,000 actions taken globally. 120,000 of those are risk assessments. We've had almost 90,000 service directory searches and almost 50,000 journal entries sent. So we can see here how many people we are reaching. And we want people to access Bright Sky, but this also means raising awareness of it. So if we talk about marketing an app like Bright Sky, I would sort of say, what are those instant concerns? I think what normally comes up for people when I ask this question is that, what if the perpetrator finds the app or the website on the survivor's phone or in their search history? And therefore it means the risk is escal escalated for the survivor and therefore an increased risk of harm or even risk to life. So as I showed you, Bright Sky has had many different iterations and in that different communications plans. So when we first started, Bright Sky really only was shared with domestic abuse professionals. But as we began to change the app, we opened up communications, first starting with more targeted, and then now in wider risk assessed communications plans, as well as things like social media. We actually have one right now running across social media for 16 days of action. So how do we communicate this product without exacerbating risk? Well, firstly, messaging. So we used to speak about Bright Sky by saying, if you or someone you know is experiencing domestic abuse. So in that, we provided a direct call to action to the survivor. We were telling them that this is for you. But in the new messaging, anyone concerned about domestic abuse, it's more neutral, flippant even. 
and in that it is less of a call to action to the perpetrator. As well, when we are speaking about Bright Sky, we focus on the features of the app that won't risk the safety of the user. So we talk about education, we talk about the service directory, and we talk about the risk assessments. Our development was also a way of actually being able to communicate more openly. So as I showed you earlier, the movement from pathways through to the more neutral interface meant that we increased the safety of the user by meaning if it was ever found on a phone, it appeared to be more of a general app for anyone, which it is, but it also means it protects survivors who are using it. We also work with very strategic and laid out communications. So we work with above the line and below the line communications. So what that means is above the line is things like broad messaging. We focus on domestic abuse prevalence and need, and we highlight the responsibility of people like the public, employers, friends and family. It's not directed towards a survivor. And our below the line communication is more targeted directly to a survivor. It talks as Bright Sky as a key safeguarding tool and something that can support them in their journey. So in terms of above the line, that looks at things like magazines, social media, news and podcasts, even policy. But with below the line, it's things like QR codes, posters. We work with people like midwives and nail salons, hairdressers, places where a, su a survivor might be without the perpetrator. And a really amazing sort of uh, best practice here from our colleagues at Bright Sky Hungary is the posters and wall stickers that they put in women's bathrooms. So it allowed the user to read some information, very simple about domestic abuse, and then led them through to Bright Sky. And the thing is, whilst we know not all survivors are women, the majority of them are. And whilst we know not all perpetrators are men, we also know the majority of them are. So through accessing women in women-only spaces, we are increasing our reach, but reducing the risk. So you might think then, well, in terms of social media, everyone has access to it. We could reach so many people. How on earth do you risk assess something like a social media campaign? Well, we do it very similarly to the way we would public spaces. We target specific demographics by looking at age, gender, interests, and focusing those campaigns going out to those specific people. As you can see here just played, the It's Not Nothing campaign, which went out in July and is now out again in a different format, is about raising awareness around coercive control. And that is our focus. We are looking to raise awareness and educate on the problem, not the product. What we then do through our education is provide a call to action to the user to go through and download Bright Sky or visit the website. So we provide them the education and then the solution. And the thing is we need education to change the domestic abuse landscape and increase Bright Sky's use. But we also need Bright Sky to educate people and spark those conversations. So our campaigns are so important because they help ensure this continued cycle of people reaching Bright Sky and then offering survivors support. So lastly, I want to just speak to you a little bit about the future of Bright Sky. So here at Bright Sky, what we say is we stand up to domestic abuse. What we mean by that is that we work to move a victim survivor through to a thriver, meaning they can live a life free of violence. And we do that through our meaningful partnerships. Our focus is always listening to sectors, partners and survivors and having them lead the way for us, putting user feedback at the heart of everything we do, our development, our strategy. It is so important that we continue to ensure a stable and consistent product on the back end and the front end, and that we remain agile because, as you all know, the domestic abuse landscape is forever changing. Importantly, we are always listening to survivors to hear what they need to feel safe using technology and making sure that that leads what we are doing and what we are changing. And lastly, we invite in partnerships because we know we are only as strong as the people that we work with and that we need everyone to stand up to domestic abuse and to support survivors. So recent research by the Vodafone Group Foundation showed us that actually awareness of Bright Sky 
is pretty good. At least one in 10 victims were aware of the app and that the initial reaction from them is very positive. They felt the app was confidential, safe and anonymous, which is the cornerstone of what we do. And it's all well and good me telling you that the app and website are fantastic, but what really matters is that survivors say that. And as you can see here, we have those who have fed back and said, well, we've used it to help others. Well, actually, this product helped me move through the trauma and abuse I experienced. And those who perhaps have helped someone before had wished Bright Sky had existed when they were supporting someone who was experiencing abuse. So Bright Sky's future. Well, we're going to continue looking into Bright Sky, particularly uh, research into bystanders and the role in which they play in supporting survivors and getting Bright Sky out there. And also app safety, because I've, as I've said, it's so important to us that it continues to meet the needs of survivors by being a safe product to use. We're going to continue to collaborate, building partnerships, especially looking to corporates and the role that they play in supporting employees who might be experiencing abuse. We're looking to increase access by things through perhaps a chat box within the app. Is it something survivors need to download the, phone, uh, download the app to their phone or go to the website and directly be able to message a support service? And then we're going to continue our campaigns because we understand that educating and raising awareness around domestic abuse is as important as Bright Sky. So to finish up, I want to bring you back around to where I started, where people asked me if I'm going to miss helping people by moving to this role at Bright Sky. And when you're not frontline, you don't get to see the progress. You don't get to see the movement and the healing with the survivor. And ultimately that's good because confidentiality is so important. It's one of our biggest strengths at Bright Sky. But one thing that always sticks with me is Bright Sky's tagline, which is you are not alone. And given the feedback we receive, the research that we've done, and the way in which Bright Sky is really changing the landscape of accessing domestic abuse support, I think I can confidently say that at the end of every day, I go to sleep knowing that we are helping people all across the world. And I will leave here some quotes from users themselves as to what Bright Sky has really meant for them. Thank you very much, Phoebe, for your presentation. And uh, if you would like to join us uh, with uh, your questions, please uh, do it now. Do it through slido.com, hashtag uh, Bright Sky. And uh, we have just... Uh, Two questions here, so let's uh, let's have a look at them. Uh, what is the most used function of the app? Globally, the service directory is always the most used across every single country. That's consistent, and I think it's because it is one of the most unique features that Bright Sky has. It is, for most countries, the only nationwide service directory that exists, so it allows users to reach specialist help, which ultimately, like I've been telling you for the last 40 minutes, is the main purpose of Bright Sky. Then also the risk assessments are used very often across all countries. But then our number three action really begins to change, and that's where you see the nuance country by country. So online safety guide can be very popular, but then also we may see some countries um, having more information or sort of more uh, users, sorry, using things like the how can I help. So we begin to see really interesting patterns in sort of what the users of each individual country are really needing. Thank you. Uh, another question is, um, survivors often have their phone controlled by the perpetrator. How do you prevent Bright Sky from being found? Isn't it dangerous to have it in the phone? I mean, it's a, it's a great question. I feel like we've um, touched on it a little bit within the um, presentation, but ultimately we know Bright Sky isn't going to be safe for everyone and we provide users the information needed at the very beginning before downloading the app to be able to risk assess their own situation and know whether that is safe. But then we take the mitigations like I've walked us through around things like messaging about the how we structure the app. There are certain features that help a user within Bright Sky to feel safer when using it. 
And that is why it's so important for us to reach bystanders. And by that, we mean family, friends, colleagues, because that means they can access Bright Sky on a survivor's behalf and really take um, that risk into their hands. So we, it's not the survivor who is having it on their phones, but actually someone supporting them. So that risk isn't there at all. Well, we will now move forward to uh, the Bright Sky in the Czech Republic, which I would like to Uh, present you. So uh, my name is Veronika Řídelová and uh, I have been at uh, the head of the Bright Sky project uh, past uh, three years here in the Czech Republic and uh, in the next minutes I would like to show you our uh, path uh, from where we were at the beginning, uh, where we are and uh, where are we uh, heading to and what uh, uh, successes did we uh, have. The path from the uh, here in the Czech Republic, uh, uh, it's uh, it has been quite a long uh, from the idea until the icon which you have in the in your phone. Uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, it was an idea of a retired British policeman who uh, was uh, dealing with the, uh, with the murders as a result of the domestic violence. And uh, when he retired, uh, he wanted to uh, change the situation, to help the survivors, to help recognize that people are actually in danger. And um, he uh, wanted to, to have this tool and uh, got in touch with a uh, UK based uh, charity and developed the, the bright sky so at the at the beginning uh, there was an idea of a retired british policeman and then uh, uh, the app was uh, developed it started in the uk it went uh, to the ireland and the czech republic was the first uh, foreign language uh, country where uh, Bright Sky was uh, adapted. Of course, when we heard uh, the idea, uh, we as a Vodafone Foundation were not expert on domestic abuse. It was a new topic for us, so we needed partners. And uh, that's why we got in touch with um, um, with uh, our partners. Uh, the expert partner is um, organization ROSA, which helps women uh, victims of domestic violence uh, in, the Czech in the Czech Republic. They've been doing this uh, past 30 years and uh, they were our expert partners of uh, the Bright Sky. Of course, uh, it's a topic which is closely connected to the police and the legislation and uh, uh, crime, of course. Uh, so we needed uh, to be in touch with police and uh, the Ministry of Interior. All of these four partners then created a working group and uh, back in the 2019, we started working on the adaptation of the Bright Sky mobile app which was launched and um, because it was um, an idea from the uh, Great Britain, we got in touch with uh, British ambassador here in Prague, uh, Mr. Nick Archer, uh, who has been supporting uh, uh, the idea. Uh, we knew that we have a technology innovation, uh, British technology innovation, which will be helping in the Czech Republic. So this this was our uh, connection to the British Embassy. And uh, I must say that their contribution was uh, uh, actually very practical because uh, two of the senior diplomats here at the British Embassy actually uh, recorded the voiceover uh, for the videos in the Bright Sky app. So even today, when you switch your mobile app uh, into English and you go to watch the videos, you can hear uh, the voices of the two diplomats from the British Embassy. And we were very uh, happy and very pleased uh, of their uh, contribution. We had the app, um, sorry, uh, it's a little bit distorted, but uh, this, was the, this was the original uh, app that we developed in uh, 2019. Uh, as Phoebe was, um, was mentioning, there were two pathways. Uh, this was how we uh, promoted it, and uh, this is how it looks like uh, now. Uh, 
since the very beginning, we've, um, uh, we've approached uh, Bright Sky as a support and uh, information app. Uh, when we are promoting it, we um, are not uh, promoting it as a SOS uh, tool, uh, but rather something to uh, uh, to support and to give um, uh, information. It's accessible in um, Czech and uh, in English, so also available to uh, English-speaking, for example, expats living here in uh, in the Czech Republic. We had the the app. We presented it at um, the press conference. We presented it to the journalists, to uh, expert public. And um, the following day, in September uh, 2019, we presented it to uh, expert public because um, we needed to uh, teach them how to use uh, Bright Sky uh, when dealing with uh, uh, survivors and uh, what. Uh, tools can they uh, can they use how it can help them and um, how it can help uh, uh, not only the social workers but how it can help uh, the uh, the survivors we then moved on to the communication phoebe has um, talked a bit about it and uh, this was one of uh, our campaign uh, Řekni to dál, uh, tell it uh, further, or, uh, uh, or th this is how it can be translated, uh, for which we uh, had a chance to uh, get uh, support from uh, various uh, uh, personalities, uh, police, British ambassadors, some influencers, uh, our CEO, for example, a CEO of Vodafone, Petr Dvořák, uh, Lucie Hrdá, uh, uh, a Czech uh, lawyer specialized in the domestic um, uh, abuse, and um, so on. Uh, we combined uh, the strong uh, numbers of uh, about domestic violence together with uh, Bright Sky as a simple tool how to help. Since then we have had uh, several communications campaign. Uh, as Phoebe mentioned we are now um, focusing on um, controlling behavior, uh, promoting the information that uh, controlling behavior is also a domestic violence and it can be um, the first sign uh, when someone is controlled by, um, uh, by a partner. Uh, and um, out of these um, all campaigns, I would like to mention the one uh, here, which we've done during the COVID. Um, it was at the beginning uh, of um, lockdowns when we realized that uh, survivors and victims of domestic violence uh, got uh, caught and uh, locked uh, locked up with uh, the perpetrators at home and we realized that um, uh, postmen and um, uh, delivery services are prob probably the ones uh, who can access them and we've partnered with uh, Czech Post and uh, several delivery services here in Czech Republic and we informed their uh, mm, postmen and postwomen and delivery men uh, and delivery women how to spot the signs of domestic violence and how to offer help. Of course by offering help I do not mean um, offering uh, professional help, but rather uh, mm, directing them to Bright Sky app. And uh, this has been a very uh, successful campaign for which uh, we were um, recognized and uh, awarded a, a prize for anti-COVID uh, uh, anti uh, uh, campaign of, uh, of the year. So we are very uh, pleased for that. Uh, besides, uh, as uh, Phoebe mentioned, uh, we try to promote Bright Sky as a supporter, so you are not alone, as you can see here on one of the uh, uh, t-shirts that we've made for our uh, employees of, um, uh, of Vodafone. And uh, this campaign, uh, which is showing a window uh, of a block of flats, which is very typical for the Czech Republic, is uh, again raising awareness about uh, not to close eyes when we uh, see uh, the domestic violence uh, 
in our uh, neighborhood or, or next to us. We've been very lucky to have a uh, support of um, several Czech um, influencers, and these graphs uh, are uh, more than any uh, words I can I can comment. Uh, Any time uh, the bright sky is mentioned uh, anywhere by the influencers, we can actually see it in the uh, in the numbers, and. Um, especially on those uh, influencers who uh, whose audience is uh, mainly uh, women uh, we can see the uh, the downloads are uh, rising uh, where we are now uh, currently in um, in the Czech Republic we have around uh, 7500 uh, downloads um, we see that um, uh, the app has been used uh, uh, 6,000 uh, 6, times uh, for the risk assessment tool, uh, 2,000 times uh, risk assessment tool uh, uh, for the people who were afraid, uh, who were uh, uh, afraid about someone uh, close to them, and then 3,000 times uh, find, uh, find expert help. Those are the uh, numbers of the uh, Czech uh, uh, app. Uh, as for the feedback, uh, it's um, quite challenging for us uh, to receive um, uh, feedback uh, about uh, the app because uh, from the survivors, um, of course, uh, they have different uh, um, issues to deal with um, if they use a bright sky app uh, letting us know that they they had used the bright sky app is probably at the end of uh, it's it's a priority number 10 uh, so we are actually collecting the the feedback from uh, the expert organization from the police um, who are uh, you know, valuing uh, bright sky as a uh, as a prime example of accessing help. Uh, so uh, this was in a nutshell what we have uh, accomplished uh, here in the Czech Republic. If I uh, should look forward, uh, what we will be doing, we will be uh, uh, focusing on training policemen, uh, on training social workers, so that everyone uh, who is dealing with uh, victims uh, of domestic violence and of survivors uh, know as how to use the app and uh, knows uh, uh, all the functions and so on. If you don't have a Bright Sky app in your phone, I encourage you to download it and uh, uh, learn how it works and maybe tell someone about it because you never know who are you talking to and who whether uh, that person might uh, not uh, need it so thank you very much uh, this was uh, uh, this was a bright sky uh, in the Czech Republic and uh, if you would like to join us with uh, your comments uh, or question please uh, feel free to do so uh, through slido.com hashtag bright sky uh, we have one Question here now. Domestic violence often affects children too. Can they use Bright Sky as well? If not, do you plan to make an app more accessible to kids? Again, a question about kids every time we. Every time. <laughs> So Bright Sky is uh, specifically for adults and people over the age of 18 and that's because it's extremely important to us that we risk assess the app in a way that means we are keeping users as safe as possible. So we provide information for people to be able to understand whether or not the app is safe for them to download. And it wouldn't really be ethical with Bright Sky and the information that it has for us to offer that currently to people who are under 18, because we are then assuming that um, a child is able to risk assess their own situation, which is, um, yeah, it doesn't fall in line with safeguarding procedure. However, we are constantly looking at the ways in which we can improve Bright Sky, the information that is needed. And this is often, as Veronica said, a question that comes up. So we are always looking into, is there more information we can provide in this subject matter? And um, are there more ways for us to be able to reach this need? So uh, we are aware of it and working on it in the background. 
thank you very much. I think that we've uh, we've covered uh, uh, everything uh, that was uh, expected and promised. I hope you have learned uh, something useful, and uh, you know now about this um, uh, global tool which is helping uh, around the world. I would like to thank you, Phoebe, for your time and uh, for presenting uh, Bright Sky and for uh, your work that you are doing on a global uh, scale and for your time here in Prague. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, to everyone who has watched us, who has visited us, and uh, I will look forward to see you some other time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day.